welcome to Elixir Wizards, a podcast brought to you by Smart Logic, a custom web and mobile development shop based in Baltimore. My name is Justice Eepin, and I'll be your host. I'm joined by my spellbinding co-host, Sunday Mint, and my ethereal producer, Eric Ostrich. This season's theme, we're talking about adopting Elixir, and we're joined by a special guest today, Vicky Ferdosh from Cisco. How are you doing, Vicky? Hi. Very nice to be here. Hello, guys. We're so glad to have you on the show. Uh, we're going to actually be talking a little bit more about Erlang today than we will be talking about Elixir. But before we jump into the whole world of Erlang and the work that you've been doing, we want to just get to know you a little bit, Vicky. If you could tell us a little bit about how you got into programming, the industry. Did you teach yourself? Were you classically trained? So how I got into programming, it's kind of a funny story. So I wanted to be part of a choir at uh, elementary school. And then, you know, I went to these auditions. <laughs> they listened to me and then they told my parents like, yeah, so we are starting an informatics faculty. So maybe that would be a better pass for her. <laughs> to there I got accepted. And, and then I really started to love programming. So my first programming language was basic. I started coding, I think, at the age of nine or yeah so it's it's been a long journey but i really really enjoy coding so it's it's really good so since after that i went into this specialized high school where i didn't have any choir still but a lot of programming <laughs> and then i went into university so yeah i walked through all academic ladders and then i went to code basically do you remember any of the kind of early experience of learning basic in, I mean, elementary school learning basic sounds just look wild to me. Yeah, right. So I, I think the first program that I wrote was, I think, uh, summing up two numbers. And I was just so happy that it worked. It was magical. <laughs> I mean, it was truly magical. That might be the key to teaching younger children you know, giving them the easy wins, maybe not easy, oh, yes. the early wins. They'll remember it. You clearly remember it. That's great. <laughs> yes. What was your first programming job? Did you get that right out of college or did you have an internship? So I first learned how to do websites. It's quite interesting. So I was doing HTML, PHP, and, and I learned that at high school. And then I, I went around like, hello, do you want to get a website? Hello, do you want to get a website? So this is how it all started. Uh, and then during university, I was, during my bachelor's, I was working as a PHP developer. So nowadays you're at Cisco. And I think that the title that we found for you is NSO Core Engineer. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. I work in the, in the NSO team. What does NSO stand for? NSO is a platform. In maybe in three sentences, it would be like a, a network operating system, device automation platform, and it's an orchestration uh, engine. And and there the core means that I work on the platform, on the core of the platform itself. And we are focused on on services. So under services. We mean any types of services and policies, so like any rules that you can define and feed into the network, like consider virtual private networks or policies involving access control lists or, or just like redirecting a small percentage of the traffic to a canary deployment. And then in ASO, we have this patented algorithm called FastMap that gives a very, very elegant way to handle full service lifecycle management. And that, there I, I work on a platform on the core part. It's uh, fast map based services, implementing network-wide transactions, because our goal is to ensure that the network is consistent and the changes are carried out in a transactional fashion. And we, we of course, always try to ensure the consistency of the network. And for this, I use Erlang to solve this task. Is it like 80% Erlang or 100% Erlang that you're writing on the day-to-day? 99.99. -day? 99 .99. <laughs> did you start using Erlang only after you joined Cisco or were you writing Erlang before? I mean, how did you kind of journey into your Erlang path? Yeah, because it's very far away from PHP, right? 
<laughs> so I was in, in, in university trying to find a bachelor thesis. And I was really enjoying a class that was about proving correctness of parallel programs. And, and there we, we did implement parallel programs. And that was, again, like this magical moment that, wow, they can run in parallel. And oh, it's so beautiful. And then so I, I contacted the teacher who, and I asked, okay, but then in what, in what language? And she said, Erlang. And I was like, what? And so, yeah, this is how I entered into her life. So she gave me books that I learned through. And then this is how I started. So it was in 2010, like 10 years ago, uh, when I wrote my first Erlang Wish program. <laughs> we can talk about it a bit later. But yeah, so uh, it was part of the Refactorer project, actually, where I, where I did it. I did the web-based interface of Refactorer. <laughs> as bachelor's thesis in Erlang. And this is a great segue because one of the talks that you gave at Codebeam last year was called Think in Erlang. Is that right? Oh, yeah, that's great. I really enjoyed giving that talk. Most of our audience is coming from either the Elixir world or they're interested in Elixir. Obviously, Elixir is built on top of Erlang. I'm curious if you could maybe for someone with that perspective who's maybe working in Elixir but hasn't really gotten into Erlang internals yet. How do you start thinking in Erlang? I think the thing is that, that we, or at least me, I really got used to think imperatively. And where what I mean is that, that we try to be like totally in control, right? We, we go through lists by indexing them and and we always try to describe the program like, okay, if this is the case, then we go this way, otherwise that way. And, and, and we are super in control. And uh, I think this is like very, very far from how I like to think in Erlang. Because I think in Erlang, we need to let the computer take a bit of the control. We, what we should deal with is like, what is our problem? And we should try to give a mapping that takes our input, the problem, and then transforms it into a solution. So I think we should focus on the input and on the output. What we are trying to do is we are trying to, to build a mapping, to build a function around it. So we are going to, to refine our input until it is turned into output. And it's easy to say, but I do remember my, my first Erlang code. So I think I even used the list SACU to try to index that list because come on, how can I go through a list without indexes? Then all, I think I overused function expressions, you know, the lambdas, the, the closures, which I tried not to do it, but it was so cool. It was not really part of any other language back then what I used. So it's like, yeah, it's nice. It's new. I need to use it. And, I, and then I overused it. The another thing is that I think, or at least how I programmed before, was that I had huge functions. What I mean is like that the body of the function was very, very long. So that when you try to do that in Erlang with a lot of cases and ifs, I think it, it, it gets a bit ugly. So that, that I, I try to avoid as well. And then, of course, the processes. It is so easy to spawn processes. That's the easiest thing to do, so to say. But then there will be a point in life where you where you hit yourself, that you spawn too many processes. <laughs> and then you realize that, mm, okay, maybe I need to have a strategy of, of how many process I would like to spawn and, and do so. What kind of issues do you run into that let you know that you're spawning too many processes? Right. So I was trying to schedule tasks. And then it happened to be that there were too many tasks. And so what happened is that the tasks that were realized as one-one processes. At the end, what they were just doing is that they were fighting for the common risk for the shared resource. So it can happen that if you have too many processes, your overall throughput will decrease. So the first place you'll notice is sort of in just performance ramifications. Yes, or or you know, if you look into into your processes that are running and, and you see that most of the processes are waiting. And then there is something again there. 
Do you think that maybe from a high level view, like like we said, uh, a lot of our listeners are, are strictly Elixir developers or looking to get into Elixir. And, and as Justice mentioned, not all of them know the underlying functionality of Erlang. If you had to sum up what Erlang is, and maybe if you can go a little further and talk about like how Elixir might be built on top of it, just I think we love to hear it from your perspective. What Erlang is and, and what it gives to people that other languages don't have. I think that would be a really good spot for people to hear more about it. Right. So Erlang, the shared nothing, that's a beautiful thing. So if you if you look into a lot of literature in computer science, then then what you see is that like crazy amount of books deals with how to protect the critical section how to be sure that if I put together two program components and then I run them in parallel, they are not going to interfere with each other. Share nothing. I'm not saying it solves it 100%, but solves most of it. That's very beautiful. But of course, it has some downsides as well. So you are going to hold in the process space the data that the process can Access, meaning that if you have like multiple processes using the same data, then it's almost all the cases is going to be copied. So you are going to have shared instances of that data. So that's the downside of shared nothing, but I I really like to work with it. I think once you start enjoying it, that, that there are no shared variables, there are no global variables, life becomes way, way, way better. I think you can write simpler programs. You can reason about your your code way easier. You can look and understand other people's code way easier. I think processes, right? So processes um, is an entity that is executing a function. Well, it's executing code. So processes brings you a very nice way, kind of like a an agent style concurrency. So like you write your independent agents and then they are going to work to reach the same common goal by by sharing tasks. They will work independently. And and sometimes they can synchronize and the synchronization is through message passing, not through shared variables, which is again a much cleaner, at least to me, concept. Processes, message passing, share nothing, I would highlight this, this characteristic of Erlang. That I think it's, it's very useful to understand, like deep, and exploit it, because it, it does give you benefits. Let me ask you this. If you can think back to when you were first starting Erlang, do you remember what the most challenging hurdles were in terms of learning and becoming productive in the language? I think recursion is... It's hard to get it right because you are trying to write a tail recursive function, but, but but at the same time you are used to for each loops, and that's a long distance to to get there. Then understanding gen servers, I think that was interesting from the point of view that it is a server, it's a generic server, and then and then we have like the synchronous and asynchronous operations towards the server. And then what does this mean from the client side? What does this mean from the server side? And then, of course, I made the mistake of calling gen server call from inside the gen server and not really understanding why, what's happening and why can't I no longer talk to my server and <laughs> all that craziness. And, and then when I saw that I got gen servers right, then, then I overused them. So I started to put processes everywhere because like, oh, it's so cool. <laughs> they can hold the state and then I can ask them, you know, then I got back my global variable, so to say. So somebody finally hold my data and I can talk to it from everywhere. And then hmm, turn out the gen servers are uh, serializing your request. So... To get my the value of my beautiful global variable, I was serializing my system. That was disappointing when I realized that. I'm sensing a theme. You get excited and then use it too much. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
I love that though. It's really awesome to see that, you know, we love Elixir obviously, and you definitely seem to love Erlang a lot. And I guess, how do you convert that enthusiasm over to other people when you're trying to maybe teach them, if you've got a new team member, or you're just trying to convince your JavaScript friend or your Ruby friend that they need to get on Erlang? Like, What's your elevator pitch for Erlang to your, to your friends or colleagues? So I was working at my university. We were doing a software technology lab, which was in Erlang, and, and we got a lot of students there. And imagine that the mathematicians were the ones who got Erlang the fastest. And, and it's because it's so close, like you write a function and then it has a definition. It's so close to the mathematical meaning of functions and they had much less computer science classes otherwise. So they, they brain it and got through it. So I think that, that was, for instance, an interesting thing to find out, right? And how would I convince my friends to write Erlang? I want to jump into some of what we talked about before the call, you recently gave a talk also at CodeBeam. You've given a lot of talks at CodeBeam and, and we, we should probably talk a little bit about how you got to do that so much. But I, I want to know about securing the beam. I want to know about Erlang security. It's been on your mind lately. What does, especially someone maybe moving into Erlang need to know? It's not easy. It's not given. That's that's a sad but true news. So the platform doesn't really give you a lot. The thing is that how Erlang was designed, that it's going to run in a private network behind corporate firewall, and the nodes are absolutely locked away. They are locked down. They're in, to in a box. Nobody can talk to them. The first thing that we need to observe is that it's not how we use Erlang today. And the thing is that the platform or what we get right from the platform is, has not really been changed, which means that the burden is on us, on programmers. So everybody needs to really, really understand it and, and be aware of it. And then what I noticed, I think it was two years ago when, when I first started to, to deal with it. Back then I was working at a bank, so it was kind of important. I think it's important in every company, but there we were extra, extra, super careful, so to say. And what I noticed is that when I looked into, into related work in research in academia, there were nothing. I mean, not literally nothing, but it was not a well researched topic. And I got really surprised. And then I looked into challenges because, you know, one often says that, yeah, sure, put up the firewalls and then everything is fine because we know that the distribution protocol of Erlang is like, e -e -e, no, you don't want to go with that, just, with just that to protect your VM. Could you talk about why? Like, what, what, what about the distribution protocol? Like, what does that mean to someone who's like brand new? If you want to have an Erlang cluster where you have multiple nodes connected to each other and then they talk to each other, Erlang provides a built-in way, which is through Erlang distribution protocol. So what happens is that when, when the two nodes join together, so they are going always going to build up this mesh network, so a node is connected to every other node. How is the, the authentication? Is that they check each other's cookie. So this cookie is a string, basically, and that's what one node sends to the other. And then based on that, if the cookie is the same, then, then the two nodes can join. Now, this sounds a bit weak. I mean, we have way better authentication mechanisms in place. Because I'm extremely naive, what about the cookie method is creating a vulnerability? How does one exploit that? Like, why, as uh, someone who's just getting started with you know distributed computing, why, why is that not a good enough solution to securing your, your cluster? First of all, that it's very easy to, to retry it multiple ways with different cookies, and then sooner or later I will get the right cookie. But there is another thing, which is that, I don't know if you heard about atoms. They are in, in Elixir as well. So the node names are atoms. And then whenever you try to, to join, then there is a, a vulnerability. So what happens is that when you join, then there is a, 
what is sent is your your node name and the cookie and that node name is going to be converted to atom before the cookie is checked meaning that if i just open a tcp socket two bars zero long node start sending the name and the cookie and i send multiple names like a hundred thousand names i don't even need to go that far then i'm going to crash the node without even joining to it. Because, you know, with the atoms, what's happening is that there is like this atom table that's fixed sized. And well, when you reach the, the limit, then the VM is just going to terminate. Yeah, we see that in Elixir. Every once in a while, you know, I'll, I'll be using something that's a string and I'm, I want to say, oh, I want a string to atom that. And you never, and I've always been told you can, you can't do that. You shouldn't do that because you can't be generating new atoms because of the atom limit and all of that. And I kind of always knew that, but I didn't know the the story behind that. I guess I kind of vaguely knew it was a security risk and you would crash your application if you were generating too many atoms, but it that definitely gives it a little more context. <laughs> okay. That that's good. Yeah. Yeah, you are going definitely going to crash it. But I think you can sometimes do it. I wouldn't go like absolutely ballistic on don't use list to atom or string to atom in Elixir. I would say that if you know that the strings that you are going to give to this function can have 10 different value, all right. If that string is coming from a user, let's say it's the username, and that is what I would like to turn into atom for some reason, I wouldn't do that. I would first look into, is this username a valid username and so on? Is it a registered user? Well, most likely I would keep it as a stream. And that's the other thing. So in, in Erlang, we, we don't have a buffer overflow. And then we can say that, yes, we are awesome. But the thing is that, yeah, we can overflow the atom table. We can overflow the ETS tables. For that, we have as well as a maximum amount of ETS tables that you can make. You can look this up if you search for Erlang uh, system limits. Then you are going to get a full list of what limits you have that you don't want to reach uh, during runtime. I want to, if possible, give folks who are listening to the show, who are, most of them are probably working in Elixir, interested in learning more and more Erlang to be better at their jobs. Some of them are probably brand new to Elixir and Erlang. So I, I just want to make sure that we kind of hit all the major issues and sort of buckets of vulnerabilities that they should be on the lookout for. Are there any other high level spaces of vulnerability that we should be paying attention to when we're starting new Erlang projects or maintaining them? There are three classes, basically. One is with what you can compromise the confidentiality of the system. And there the problem is like the SSL crypto libraries. They are not shipped with the most secure configuration by default. So what this means is that you need to look into, into the configuration and then and then you need to fine-tune it before you release your, your product. Then the second thing is about the integrity of the system. So we would like to avoid that that information is, is unexpectedly modified. Now, how can information get unexpectedly modified? We have the OS module which allows you to run your OS command. Then there are port commands. Then there are different functions allowing runtime evaluation of terms. Now, there you definitely don't want to let any user input flowing in, right? Because then, well, it's either a bash injection or an Erlang code injection that you are going to execute. And then the third group, would be availability that we briefly touched. So, you know, we would like to have our server always up and running, serving requests. But if we reach the maximum number of atom tables, then, well, then we crash the system. So that's, that's not okay. So look into system limits and all these runtime evaluation options that we have built into the language. With that, you can compromise availability as well. And again, let me say that this is not black and white. So you can convert anything to Atom if you need to. You, you can create a new ETS table anytime if you want. The thing is that you need to be really sure that 
the data that you are converting is secured. So there was like proper input validation, sanitization. You are sure that the data is, is not malicious. And then you can use these functions. Yeah, and we'll have links to the system limits and then also SSL distribution. <laughs> Elixir has something called string to existing atom, which may may save your bacon. That's the one I always ended up using. <laughs> That's safe. <laughs> That's good. And we're taking a quick break. We'll be back to the main interview in just a few minutes. But first, we have a short mini feature segment where we spend a little time with someone from a company using Elixir in production, learning more about how they use Elixir. Enjoy it. And we'll be right back after this. Hello, and welcome to our new mini feature segment of Elixir Wizards. My name is Sandy Mint, and today we're speaking with Christian Cook, Senior Platform Engineer at Cars.com. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining us today. So before we get into how you're using Elixir at Cars.com, can you give us a little bit of your background and how you got into programming and maybe where you got started with Elixir? So I've been a professional software engineer for about 12 years. I like to say an occasionally skilled amateur for longer. So I studied some computer science in college, learned a, you know enough C to be dangerous, and then later on started learning Ruby and then Ruby on Rails, which I used professionally for five or six years. And then like a lot of people, I discovered Elixir probably about four years ago now. And it's been a really great experience with that language ever since. That's awesome. So did you transition to Elixir while you were at cars.com or was that like a hobby thing that you found on your own? What was your journey to Elixir there? I was actually at my previous employer. We were primarily doing Ruby on Rails and we had a couple new greenfield projects and we investigated some alternative technologies, alternative languages to use. And Elixir was largely at my encouragement, the the language that we landed on for a couple of service-backed APIs, sort of non-public facing services. Great. So could you give our listeners a quick introduction to cars.com, where you're based, what you do? Cars.com is headquartered in Chicago, Illinois. It's a digital marketplace solutions provider for the automotive industry that connects car shoppers with sellers. Great. And can you speak to, to how you're incorporating Elixir into your product? Is it a consumer facing application or are you just using it internally? So actually, we're in the process of a major replatforming initiative. We're converting the entire cars.com application stack to use Elixir. This includes the customer-facing website, which we're writing in Elixir and Phoenix. We're in the final months of this effort and expect the Elixir site to go live in early 2021. So this is not just like cars.com, but it's a number of back-end services, data ingestion, API, analytics, reporting. And so what were you using before the overhaul? More or less everything. Cars.com has been a pretty substantial website for a pretty long time, you know, since the, the early dot-com days. And the existing application has just grown up organically over time to be pretty broad. There was a lot of Java in the application and just a number of ancillary services in various different languages. So this effort over the past 18 months has been to unify all the technology around Elixir. That's awesome. Something that we talk a lot about on the show is for overhauls like this, what was the process like to get your higher ups on board with, you know, bringing on a new programming language and how did you present Elixir as like the end all be all solution? So I think a lot of it was driven by dollars and cents argument. You know, we had a number of expensive legacy contracts for various services, database services or analytic services or a number of other things. And because Elixir and really the the Beam give us so much ability to do our own versions of those, to bring that into, you know, open source technology and eliminate contracts that despite the really bold investment that was required to engage in this effort, ultimately it's going to be a cost-saving endeavor for the company. And I think that was really one of the key pieces that our CTO, a gentleman named Fred Lee, that, that was the key promise that he was able to make to help sell the company on the value of this 
initiative. So as you were kind of ramping up on Elixir with your team, were you onboarding more or were you just, were you hiring for Elixir? Were you training internally for Elixir? How, how are you ramping up your team? It's always a challenge to find experienced Elixir engineers. They're not only in demand, but there aren't that many of them. So we've made all our hiring decisions regardless of any previous Elixir experience. It's a nice to have, but it's never been a requirement for us. So we've taken an approach of you know, bringing on people who are talented and adept engineers and who fit with our sort of culture of inclusivity and you know, raising your hand when you don't know something and training them with the Elixir skills as we go. When you're onboarding new engineers who have no Elixir experience, like maybe what is a, a ramp up method that you, you use to get them started on that path? There are a number of tools that we've used for this. The collaborative programming exercises like Cohen's and Kata's are always sort of a starter for us. And then we get into some of the more interactive programming challenges. And along the way, we do just a lot of pair programming. We're a very collaborative group. So for people who are coming new to Elixir, depending on where they're at, you know, we often will pair them up with a specific mentor as well. It's really trying to fit the education to the person and their skill level as, as best we can. Absolutely. I've always been a, a strong supporter of pair programming for, for learning purposes. Last question, and this one's just for fun. If you weren't a software developer, what would you be? What would be an alternate career path for you? <laughs> Coming out of college, I spent about five years living in Colorado and working as a whitewater raft guide and then skiing, working on a job that allowed me to ski during the winter. So I think there's every chance I would still be doing something like that if I hadn't if I hadn't become a software engineer. That's really fun. Skiing is not something I ever got the hang of, so that's cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Christian Cook. And to all of our listeners, if you or your company are using Elixir in an interesting way or want to come on the show for a mini feature, we'd love to have you. Reach out to us at podcast at smartlogic.io with your name, your company's name, and how you're using Elixir. Okay, that's it for this week's mini feature. Let's get back to our main interview. Going back to your talks at CodeBeam, there are a lot of folks who listen to the show who are interested at speaking at different conferences, and and I, I'm not sure if, if CodeBeam is is one that they're they're aspiring to. But just in general, do you have any advice that you'd give someone who is looking to give a talk? Don't try to give the best talk. So what I mean is that it's very easy to over push yourself and never be satisfied with with what you achieve. But the thing is, it's it's like uh, riding a bike. It's going to get better and better. So try not to set the expectations very high and and try to work with topics that, that you are really excited about. It is as well, I think, a good idea to do dry runs. Like first practice it by yourself. Then maybe involve your cat or dog or it, it, it is still safe. Then you can maybe do it to your friends who, who understand the topic because soon you would like to get feedback because feedback is important. And then I think you should do a dry run at your company because that's still a, a safe place. And But that will already feel a bit frightening because you are going to be on a new role. You are going to speak to, to other people and, and you can always have this feeling that what if it's me who who knows less about it? What if other people know more about it? What if I said something wrong? The thing is, I think this will always be true. So there are always people who know more about <laughs> that topic than you do, but there is no problem with that. But I think it's, 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 it's hard to, to get into this mindset. Was there anything specific that you did when you were applying to be a speaker? Did you do anything special or did you sort of just prepare something that you had already been working on or something you were interested in studying more about? Been very active in research. My first talk was about my my own algorithm, which is a duplicated code detector for Erlang programs. And I was really excited about it. And I was super scared because I had to present it at an academic conference and I was a master student and I was pretty sure that everyone else in the room knows much more than me. So 
<laughs> that was kind of a hard start. From a point of view, it was an easy start because I was talking about my algorithm. Who knows better the algorithm that I invented than me, right? So that gave me some, some confidence as well. And I think it's easier to talk about topics that are very concrete, very focused, than doing some fluffy general talk. I think that's that's way harder. That's that's next level. <laughs> Was that the refactor Earl project that you're talking about? Yeah, so I, I started to to work. That was actually my first Erlang job. I become this R and D fellow at the Refactor project. There I was doing the running the software technology lab, help, helping the other teachers. What is Refactor Earl for those who don't know? So Refactor is a static source code analyzer and refactoring tool for Erlang. I'm not pretty sure it works with Elixir. It might work on Elixir. <laughs> the audience more. can't see the dad joke face that Justice made, but I'm noting it here. <laughs> But go on. Did you help to found Refactor Earl or you were hired there? Tell, tell us a little bit more. Give us a little bit more context there. Oh, okay. No, I was just lucky to join. So I was invited by the teacher who was uh, the supervisor of my bachelor thesis. Basically, this is how I ended up there. And then first I was just a student. And then they, they said that, okay, it looks like she she could contribute more. So we can offer her a job. And this is how I ended up there. It was really fun. I really enjoyed it. And and working in Refactor, like working in a static analyzer of, of uh, Erlang program, static analyzer means that we don't execute the code. The program studies in the source code of another program. And, and this is how we, we build up information about the code. And then we can do refactoring, like moving around functions. And then there I, I chose a topic that was a duplicated code detection for Erlang. And then that's, that's what I worked on mostly. I feel like there's a lot that we could go into there, but it's a great segue into this next question, which is what are the bad parts of Erlang? The strings. That's terrible. The strings? The strings are terrible. <laughs> Oh my God. I think I know why, but you should tell us why. Why are they terrible? Oh, it's just so wrong. It's wrong in many ways. And the string uh, manipulating functions that's provided by Erlang, not good. And what I mean there, it's not good, is that the API is, is not really consistent. And I know that this is all fixed in Elixir, and I'm kind of jealous of you guys. That part is way better in Elixir. Which is another great segue because we were going to ask if you've used Elixir and what your opinion is of it. Right. So I was once in a project where I was trying to provide the, the core functionalities. We were building up a new platform and and there was a team who were, who already used Ruby and then they were like really interested into, into trying and learning and using Elixir. So they chose to use Elixir to build the functionalities on top of the platform that, that I implemented. And I was very in love with Erlang already. So I said that it's okay because I heard they will work together. So what I did is that I implemented the core in Erlang. They implemented their libraries in Elixir, calling into my Erlang libraries, right? And then we used the mix project to, to build it up and it worked beautifully. I was so amazed because I was like, yeah, at the beginning, yeah, we can try. I don't know what's go how is this going to end, but it went very well. That's exciting to hear. The way you opened that up, I was really expecting it to have failed somehow. <laughs> I thought it was going the other way, but that's nice. It went well. What was your kind of takeaway from that project? I mean, you said it went really well. Do you think you would want to do something like that again, like implement something with Erlang and have another team kind of build off of it in Elixir? Yeah, sure. It went very well. The the thing that I learned that in, in Elixir, there is this, uh, you will help me out if I'm very wrong. You can have structs, right? Correct. Okay. So for some reason, and I'm pretty sure it's my own personal limitation, I wasn't able to understand, parse, and get information out of that struct in Erlang. That, that, that was the, the biggest pain point that we had. So 
I would say that if you build up teams and, and one team uses Erlang, another team uses Elixir, I think they can they can live in harmony. It, it, it's going to be a nice, perfect word. It's okay. And would you recommend for, for most Elixir developers that they kind of go deeper into Erlang to understand sort of how that connection is? Or, or maybe do you have any recommendations for resources for them? Uh, to understand how to connect the projects together? Maybe learn a little more about Erlang from a base standpoint, because, you know, a lot of us use Elixir and we, we learn the, the fun and the shiny parts, but we don't understand how it works under the hood all the time. Right. So I think if, if you are curious, because you think this is how it should start, so it shouldn't be a mandatory thing, because Elixir is, is, is very well built. You are very safe to use it. But I would look into... I will need to be very careful here not to list everything. But I would look into processes, how they work, how the linking works between processes, how errors are propagated, supervisors, gen servers. I think you do use them in Elixir as well. So maybe it's nice to understand the different restart strategies to be able to write a system that if you unplug it, uh, there will be still no catastrophe because you can handle graceful, abnormal termination as well. I've got one more question for you before we give you a chance to plug anything you want. And on your code beam, code sync biography, it says she believes that research is to be consumed by industry. And my question was, is that something you actually believe or did they just make that up? <laughs> and if you do believe it, what does it mean and why is research to be consumed by industry? Yeah, I, I do believe in it. So no, they didn't make it up. So what I think is that industry and academia should really work more closer together because they can help each other. What I believe is that industry can give hot topics to academia so then they can they can do their research on it which means that that their research work is going to become much more impactful which is something that the researcher would like the other way is like wouldn't it be nice to us in the industry that that somebody gives us the best algorithm and then it's, it's tested, we know it's correct, it's going to solve our problem, and it's going to solve our problem in a performant way, and then we will just adopt that algorithm, which means that our time to market is going to be reduced, which means that we can deal with unsolved challenges, we can deal with real problems. And we are not going to reinvent the wheel. I mean, who wants to re-implement again Pox's algorithm? We don't do that. We use it, right? So I think both sides can benefit, but I personally think that I try to keep myself up to date with, uh, with research, which is like a huge, huge field, so you need to pick your poisons. But the things I read, I think... They make me a better engineer. I, I can use them, even like more old stuff that you, you can use. So there is no validity or research. Even, even if it's old, you can still use it. And so, for instance, I realized that that reorder or generating a, a diff that we send to the devices can be a topological sort of the graph. And that's so interesting because then you connect the, the abstract word and then then you can use it and then you know the properties and then you can reason about why your implementation is going to be correct. So I think academia and research make me a better engineer. And, and it's the other way around. So I'm in industry for eight years and I'm surrounded by real problems. And that's cool because now I know where, where I want to focus and, 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 and what I want to do. And since I know research, I, I see that, like, oh, I wanted to use some something that's ready and there is nothing that's ready. That means that hmm, maybe I can write about it. Maybe that's my next topic that I want to focus on. I think industry does make me a better researcher as well. 
I think my my topics are always like hot topics, topics that will will have impact and can contribute to to academia. I love it. I think that that's exactly right. All of the hard problems are in in industry. <laughs> Before we go, we want to give you the floor to make any final plugs, asks for the audience, where people can find you, etc. Use the time however you like. One is that don't forget that you need to have a secure lung system. It's pretty important. You can look into my GitHub. It's F-O-R-D-O-S Victoria with a K, where I have a prototype to help you find vulnerabilities in your Erlang code. Very mind, it's a prototype, but I would love you to try it out. The another message is to try to mix a bit and, and meet researchers and talk with them and try to involve them in your project and, and try to learn their word. It's a very interesting word and, and their problems are very interesting and I think you can grow with it. So it would be cool as well. Be happy. Code Erlang or Elixir. Be happy. I love it. That's it for this episode of Elixir Wizards. Thanks again to our guest, Vicky Ferdosh, and my co-host, Sunday Mint, and my producer, Eric Ostrich. Once again, I am Justice Epen. Elixir Wizards is a smart logic podcast here at Smart Logic. We're always looking to take on new projects, building web apps in Elixir, Rails, and React, infrastructure projects using Kubernetes, and mobile apps using React Native. We'd love to hear from you if you have a project we could help you with. Don't forget to like and subscribe on your favorite podcast player you can find us on instagram and twitter and facebook so add us on all of those you can find me personally at just use a pen and eric at eric ostrich and sunday at sunday kin and join us again next week on elixir wizards for more on adopting elixir